I'm Reverend Bill McDonald, and uh, I decided everybody's tired of listening to me. Chris, you tired of listening to me yet? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but, I, but I'm always telling, oh. I'm always telling stories, and uh, you know, it's old guys. Chris, you wouldn't understand that you're not old yet. But us old guys, after a while, get tired of hearing ourselves. I know that's hard to believe that an Irishman could actually get tired of hearing himself talk. So I wanted to reach out there because I know some interesting people, some really new friends that I made, like yourself. We've known each other for, what, two years or so? Two and years. We've been in a, one IN events together and, uh, and a lot of chit-chat. But I found your personal story so touching, moving at times, and, and not just that it inspires me in many ways, but it's one of those stories that should be inspiring to lots of people out there, especially the younger generation, people that are going through difficult times right now. And that's what kind of started this conversation off many days ago. We decided to record that suicide and thoughts of hopelessness and, and life's got to be better than it is. Uh, these thoughts are hitting a lot of people during this lockdown. We're recording this during the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, in California here and the rest of the nation, we're pretty much locked down. So it's been people having to live with their own thoughts. And sometimes with people that don't want to be around more than a day or two and they're stuck with them. So here we are. You're not stuck with me, Chris. You can come and go as you like. <laughs> but first off, let's give you a real introduction. You're a survivor. Emotional survivor. A spiritual survivor. A suicide survivor. And I think you're one of those people that your life story, as grim as it starts off, when we meet you, we realize, you know, as bad as it was, look at the final product here. What's developing? You know, there's, there's a really a light at the end of the tunnel, and your light is growing as you grow and you learn. I'm finding that uh, knowing you from just watching your old videos when you talk about your stuff is not like knowing you now, because as you given your story to so many people, you evolved. In fact, telling the story is not a big thing for you anymore. So I'm asking you only to kind of give a the story because people have to know that life wasn't handed to you uh, like a gift. You had to fight for every moment and uh, and overcome a lot. And and you wrote a book about this. Yeah, if you've got a copy of it, why don't you hold it up there? All right. Tell us about your book. Boom, the title is Boom, The Life and Times of a Suicide Near-Death Experiencer. It is available on Amazon and Kindle. It is my life story. And yeah, it's my life story. And a, hopefully a motivational piece to those who don't feel very motivated in themselves. I, I haven't had a chance to read it. I've watched probably 10 of your interviews, so I, I got kind of an idea. And, and what I find that I understand being a minister that a lot of people won't because they'll go, oh, what is this guy? Is he anti-religion or something? No, you're not anti-God. You're not anti-anything. But you're more of a spiritually involved person. And you see the difference between mouthing words from a holy book and living a holy life. And I think that is your real message underneath that. So I just want to make that clear because I got that message. So. For the sake of, of those people listening for the first time, and I suggest that they do read your book, number one, and they look at your other videos, but give us a background. Because you started off a few months old, six months old or something, and, and your mother actually dumped you in a dumpster. Why don't you take us from there? Okay, so she threw, my mom threw me in a neighborhood dumpster. She felt like it was a good idea to go to do that because she wanted to live her own life, and I was unfortunately a burden in hers. So she threw me in a dumpster, like what better place to do that? No one will know. But the problem is there was a neighbor that came and she found me in the dump. She's, I guess the neighbor heard me crying. I hear this story from my grandma when I was five years old. She told me that, um, cause I said, grandma, how come my mom's not with me? And she said, okay, I'll be honest with you. You're five years old. You pretty much need to grow up. So I'm going to tell you. She said she threw you in a dumpster because she wanted to party. That's what it was. So months later, I guess what ended up happening was the lady found the, uh, the I'm sorry, the um the um neighbor 
heard a baby crying in the dumpster and that's when she heard it was me so she said oh my gosh i know this child i know this child's mother so my grandma was at church while she found me so the neighbor calls my grandma at church my grandma like drops everything she's doing and goes back home to get me so from then on you know she my mom was gone for however many months <clears throat> and yeah, my grandma pretty much she even went to court. She um she went to court even to get custody of me. And the judge told her, you'll never have your son again. She told my mom that. So custody was given to my grandma. So my grandma had me <clears throat> up until she was till up until I was four years old. And that's when she had a nervous breakdown. This nervous breakdown made her go to the hospital for a whole year. So during this whole year, I'm living with my mom's sister that she hated the most and her sister hated her the most and i'm basically since i'm her kid i'm known as the spawn of satan to them and um the one that's mistreated i didn't have jacket and i didn't have sh like new shoes or something like that and it was like icy outside i'm wearing a basketball short i mean a basketball jersey and shorts because i didn't have any sort sort of layers and they said I didn't deserve clothes. So that's why they didn't buy me any clothes. Um, sometimes my grandma would give me a few bucks, like maybe $5 or something, however many dollars it was, however much money it was. Um, but it, always, it would always get taken away from me from the people I was living with. They would say, you don't deserve money. You don't know how to, you don't deserve food. They would tell me that you don't deserve clothes. You don't deserve to use the computer. You don't deserve anything. So I was always locked up in my room and um, I couldn't go out and get water sometimes in the living room. So I go in the bathroom and pretend like I have to use the bathroom. So I just use faucet. I drink faucet water and then go back to my room. Oh, I flush the toilet, of course. So it made it seem like I was going to the bathroom, but I just really wanted water. And um, pretty much was like a caged dog. Um, neighbors will come, they, they'll come to my room and say, you better not um, come out. The only time I could really come out is when my social worker came and they were in the room. Usually you're supposed to leave the child alone with the social worker so they can ask them questions. But the people I lived with did not, the guardians did not let that happen. They would stay right there in the room and stare. And they made sure, they would tell me before, if you say the wrong thing, you are going to get it. And with the Christian religion, we were Baptists and we went to church on Sundays and Mondays, Wednesdays, Saturdays, all these different days. And when people are like this and they're so religious in church, it sort of changed my opinion about religion since I was young, especially when they would say this famous Bible verse, you spare the rod, you spoil the child. They could never tell me what verse it was from or what chapter or anything. They just knew that was in the Bible. So it was an excuse to beat me and stuff. So well, um, obviously the, you, weren't, the guardians, you weren't a spoiled child, right? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and the guardians I had had four kids of their own, two from different marriages and um, three from different, I'm sorry, three from two different marriages. And then they had one of their own together. So these older, the older um, girls, they left the house early. One left at like 17, one left at 14. Like they, we couldn't stay there because we were so abused. The only one that wasn't abused was their own son. So by the time all the girls left, it was just me and their son, which was complete havoc. I would get in trouble because I wouldn't let him pick on me. And I would fight back. And that's that make them mad. They would say how fat I am, you fat boy, you're a troublemaker, you'll never be, you know, you're going to go to hell and die, all types of stuff. You're going to be like your mom. And you should be in a mental institution like her. They used to say a lot of things about me. And, um, so I ended up having suicidal thoughts at a young age. And I mean, they found some, I was, I started writing lyrics, rap lyrics in the uh, fifth grade. So when I was visiting my grandma one weekend, 
they actually found these rap lyrics I was some rap lyrics I was writing and the one they found happened to be about them and it was a couple dried up tear stains on that paper I remember that and like I said by the time I was 14 I already had plenty of songs and multiple songs already written so I was like wait well, what song are they talking about <laughs> and um they called I was visiting my grandma and they said well maybe it's they called my grandma and said we found his lyrics maybe it's not a good idea for him to come back so after that I just went from one home then to another home then to another home and sometimes I would sleep outside like in the at the uh, bus station and stuff like that any every house I've been to was never a good experience it was always the same and all of them were supposed to be very religious people so that changed my opinion about religion and god period so i had suicidal thoughts and i mean i think my popularity in high school is what stopped my suicidal thoughts very popular through my whole high school experience after high school was a different story that's when my suicidal thoughts came back how was your self esteem? And that's when I started. How'd you feel about yourself? Were you blaming yourself at all? I didn't. I blamed myself for everything. I just wondered how come I could never be accepted. What did I do wrong? What did, you know, how come I can't be accepted? Well, that's, it's, that's even hard to listen to because you're at that age where that kind of molds your whole future and how you view life. So you started having negative feelings. When your first thoughts of maybe it's easier to, to leave here or to quit or to give up or to have suicide, when did these things start coming to you? When I was 23 years old, I um, started planning suicide. So from like 18 to 23, I was, that period was more of just, the drinking, the drugs, every drug I can get my hands on type thing. Um, well, not like, I mean, like more like I was like doing a lot of pills and like the weed and like liquor. That's what it was like experimenting with that, but especially like pills and like cough syrup and stuff like that. That was my main things. And I ended up getting really slumped on cough syrup and um, it was a bad experience. I almost OD'd. So I said, I'm just going to just start planning my death. I don't want to kill myself like this. I'd just rather do it a different way. So I started planning my death. Wow. And I wanted to drown myself, but I said, that'd be too easy. So I started looking out for the trains that come and what time they come. So that's the, the, um, the, the decision I came to. Okay, I'm going to go by getting hit by a train. Wow. Did you have anybody that was catching on to this? Was there some people that thought, hey, maybe that's what you're going to do? People try to stop you? The only, the only person that caught on to it was the person I was with during my near-death experience. Um, I end up talking to them, and they weren't exactly the type of person I can trust either. I didn't have, like, any friends I could trust. Like, I was only the one. I was always the one that people trusted, but I never had anyone that I could trust. It never went both ways. And this was one of my friends that were like that. So I was talking to them and I said, I'm just going to go through with this. I'm, I'm out of here. And I left their house and I started walking. Next thing you know, I'm close to the train that I wanted to die at. And I just hear the car, I just hear a car beeping at me and telling me, get in the car, get in the car. And I'm like, man, my plan is messed up already. So as I'm on the phone with her, ironic, I mean, as I'm in the car with her, ironically, my mom calls. <clears throat> and I haven't talked to her in years. Out of all the days in the world when I'm planning my suicide, this is the day that she calls at the very moment that I'm about to kill myself. So I'm like, maybe this might be the only thing that'll stop it. The thought is hearing from my mom. I'll talk to her. Why not? So I talked to her and she said, I just called you to tell you I got your number from your grandma and 
I, I want you to know I'm not your mom. I don't want you. I never have. Don't claim me as your mom and stop looking for me. So I said, okay, well, F you, you never were my mom. I tossed the phone out the window and I looked at my friend as she hit the corner and I looked at her and said, F this. I opened the door and jumped out. Not a pleasant landing, obviously. Did you hit your head? Yeah. I hit the, I, I remember my face was messed up in the front, but the back of my head, I do remember that part when I hit the head, when I hit the back of my head on the concrete and I just heard this boom type sound. And as you can tell from my book, boom, like, you know, um, boom. I just remember this muffled boom sound. And that's when my near death experience had happened. Like literally I'm trying to push myself out of my body, but I ended up getting up but i didn't know i was out of my body so as soon as i got up i'm trying to take like two or three steps boom then i'm in the air so then i feel like this void and then it's like god slash source presence i say source because some people get offended like i believe in this god or i believe in that god so i just say god slash source he's the main source you know um and i just remember that source that being like kneeling I felt his presence like kneeling down and giving me a hug like the tightest hug I could ever feel and I didn't want to end that hug <laughs> but as soon as that hug let was let go I'm like well why are I'm, I don't deserve to be around you like let me go get perfect I'll be back like I have to get perfect first I was like no I want you how you are now like I love you how you are now I'm like that can't be true I was taught that if you sin once before you you die you're gonna burn in hell like that's what i thought and i said how am i supposed to explain you when i go if i go back to earth what am i supposed to tell people they tell people who's like that um i'll go to no he says um go and tell everyone that i love them and i'm like okay that's it and he says i would go to the end of the world so everyone is with me and sure enough next thing you know I'm mid air and then I'm literally seeing angels like guardian, like my guardian angels looking, literally looking at them. They're huge, I'm like looking way up in the air because they're so big. And like one of them is telling me, one of them is stern and he's like, Are you sure you want to go? And then the other one on my right side is like, You know, you have so much to do for so many people. And he's so like sweet to me and like patient. The one, so one of them was stern. And sort of like, like aggressive. And then the other one was more like, it's okay. You're going to be okay. Good cop angel, bad cop angel. <laughs> right. So I'm looking at my body. So I'm looking at my body and um, on the ground. And it, they told me to look down. So I did. So it zooms in like a camera. And then I see my body. Then I see my friend to the side on their phone. Then I see the, um, the paramedics over my body. Then it zoomed in again, and they're like, this stuff really does happen. I'm like, wow. I'm like, how am I here? But I'm looking at myself. That's when, that's the day I started believing that there is life after death, was that day. And um, they asked me if I wanted to stay or go. So I told them I'll go back to Earth. Woke up in the hospital days later. Nurses told me they thought I was gone. At what point did you realize that you had a near-death experience, or did you even know what that was at that time? I had no idea what, the near, what a near-death experience was. I've never heard of one. And so when you came back, how long did it take you to remember that experience? I mean, was it kind of blocked out a while and it kind of foggy came back? or It was. I didn't recognize anything until... The day, about a week, a few days later, when I got released from the hospital. Um, yeah, it was a few days later. And I was being wheelchaired out, and I looked up at the sky, and I saw the horizon from the mountains, and then the sky was so clear. Then I saw the sun, and it looked so beautiful. <clears throat> For some reason, I knew. I felt like this feeling of love, like unconditional love, like the love that seems too good to be true the church is like the, the love that christians would tell me that's not 
God that's a demon because it's too good. Like God would never love you that much. It's that type of love. Like you don't have to worry. You're not judged. And I'm like, wait, I haven't been judged. And I even told a couple of the churches that I went to. I went back to a couple of churches and told them about my experience. And they all said the same thing. You met a demon, son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you didn't go to hell. You need to, you need to repent. You need to repent. God gave you another chance. Suicide is the unforgivable sin, young man. So that gets you to where you're now a young man. You've been giving, given a, a, a new lease, uh, a chance to start anew. Because obviously this must have been a changing direction in your life. I mean, obviously if something like that happens, you start to rethink things. And your relationship with, with God, obviously at that point, is different than what you've been taught. Um, what you, what'd you start to do? What what'd you do differently? What, after my experience? Yeah. Or As time grew... Did you start looking at life through a different set of eyes where you're looking at things and evaluating I, things differently? I've always had a fear of death, of dying and going to hell. Or I also used to have a bigger fear of when we die, nothing happens. Like we're just sleep for eternity. That was my biggest fear. But then I start, I have lost all fear of that after that. I was reassured. And um, that's when I started looking at everything different. So that losing that fear made me happier. So I started paying more attention more to like plants and, you know, like flowers and animals and just nature. I became, a, I've always liked sort of nature, but I really started to love it after my experience. I really loved nature. So who's the first um, Who's the first person you shared this with? Did you share it with anybody right away, or did you kind of feel who was ready to hear you? Who's ready to hear this story from you? A couple of days later, after I was released from the hospital, I told my friend that I was with about the experience. They did not believe me. They said, that stuff doesn't happen. You were just hallucinating. It, it always you had brain trauma. Yeah, yeah, it always amazes me that when people have an experience where it's 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 encapsulated in a giant love hug from the from from the creator from the the, the universe or whatever from God, uh, that it could be in any way tainted. It's like love is God, and and having met you and listened to you talk and the conversations we've had. I know that's kind of where you're at and I don't want to put words in your mouth or anything, but um, you kind of felt, came back and you kind of felt maybe I have another purpose. Maybe there's a mission. Can you talk about that? Right. Right. Um, honestly, my main takeaway from my suicide attempt and coming back was me wanting to help people pre and prevent them from going through with the suicide i want people to know and i want to spread my message to that's what a reason for my book too i hope people especially suicidal people read that book because if they can hear what someone else that actually did it they hear their experience maybe it'll give them some type of um relief I, I do know one thought when I was very suicidal was the fact that I didn't think anybody else in the world knew what I was going through. So maybe if someone else knows that, it might open up their eyes to say, well, hey, well, this person knows and they're happy now. Well, what did they do? Let me, let me see what they did. Like maybe there's hope for me too. Well, it's interesting because you, you learn from what – I mean, how many how many people that you know that have had near death experience? You've been around IANS, International Association of Near Death Studies. So, like you and I, we've both met so many people. You begin to wonder who hasn't had an experience, right. right? But right, but you've turned your experience into like a mission, and you're still a young man, still in your twenties, right? 
and uh, <clears throat> 32. Well, let's kind of give you a break here. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> but you have an opportunity to take the experience that you went through as, as bad as it was getting injured and going through all that misery emotionally and spiritually growing up. To take that and use that as a platform for others who are going through stuff. Because there's some people out there who think they're really going through some hard times. And it's like the man saying, oh, I don't have any shoes. Then you meet a man with no feet, right? There's always somebody yeah. worse, right? Your story is like the man with no feet. It's like all these people are moaning and groaning. Up, well, my mom used to pick on me. You know, well, she didn't throw you in a dumpster, did she? I mean, you know, you didn't get rejected. So your purpose and your life's story kind of go together. Because your story is about survival. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. So even though it was a terrible thing, the story becomes a vehicle of healing. And that's what I want to recommend to people. Let you posh, put your book up there again. But I recommend people buy your book. There you go. Let's say something that will show on the screen there. There you go. I don't know if you can see that. What's the title again? Boom. The Life and Times of a Suicide Near-Death Experiencer. Outstanding. All right. I had to say something because the screen on Zoom, if I'm talking, it stays on me and I wanted your book to show up. But yeah. In the future, something we were talking <clears throat> about, we're trying to find some way to reach people. So this first conversation i'm having in, in a series of conversations we may have another one uh directly about uh ways to prevent suicide i think maybe we should do one with three or four people on the screen that would be good maybe more expert in this yeah uh, maybe somebody that's lost somebody to suicide maybe somebody's thinking about suicide or survived it but uh, I, I, the message is ripe i mean i worked suicide hotline for a long time i worked from the two o'clock in the morning to seven in the morning. Doesn't sound like, yeah, it's only five hour day. No, but it's five hours with three phones all by yourself. Mm. <laughs> and trying to triage which one to talk to when they call. But when somebody calls in the hotline, they're hoping that somebody's going to listen to them. They're hoping that somebody talks them out of it. I'm hoping people look at this. If they're looking on, on the YouTube for something about suicide, that they run across this and that they can reach out to you and listen to you. So why don't you, why don't you give some contact information? If you have a website or an email address that's public that you want to share. Uh, my Facebook page. Um, and also my YouTube page, I can give contact on those. Those are the main two I'm on all the time. So Facebook is just Chris NDE. And my YouTube is No Bad Vibes Space 7. So N O B A D V I B E S Space 7. All right. So we're working together, at least at some level, because I think everybody that's uh, kind of had a near death experience, there's a connection. And I really believe, Definitely. I really believe we're all one. And I also believe this, and chime in on your thoughts on this, but I don't think you have to become dead to find this awareness of God and love. No. No. Mm -mm. So for people thinking, I'm going to commit suicide and have a near-death experience, it's not a great idea. <clears throat> uh, first off, you don't know if you're going to come back or not. Uh, and, and it's a hell of a thing to go through. It wasn't comfortable for you physically for a while. I'm assuming that you had to recover, right? Yeah, I did. I had to learn how to sort of speak again and not get my tongue stuck. Like every time I say something and I didn't have a smell, I didn't have taste, I couldn't even walk or nothing. Like I said, I was wheelchaired out of the hospital. So it took a while to get back to normal. And now you're in that new normal, which is about right. and Think about it now. You say you're, you're in your early 30s. I correct this 20s image, but you're in your early 30s. I got sweaters older than you, by the way. 
<laughs> but you're not I'm even, old on the inside. There you go. Absolutely. You've had experiences <laughs> to qualify that. But it's like yeah. you got so much time ahead to give. And you never know when the end is gonna come. You don't. Mm -hmm. But I teach people, and I think you buy into that, that we're here for one purpose. You know, you could give it different names, but basically it's to love and serve. And you can narrow that down just to loving because loving is serving. Love. And it's all love. love. Yeah. It can be reduced to love. Mag magical formula. Well, I'll tell you what. I, before we go, I want you to show the book again. Tell them where they can get it. And uh, I hope uh, they Oh, um, yeah. Boom. Life and Times of Suicide and Your Death Experience. You can get it on Amazon and Kindle. And that's it. <laughs> so, thank you, Chris. It's just, I just wanted people to know that uh, you're out there. You got a book. Your life wasn't lived in vain. It was lived with a purpose. And all the suffering that you went through, and there's no way you can deny that it wasn't terrible for a small child to go through that kind of stuff. Having come from a strange environment growing up myself, I can speak that things that happen in childhood, even if you're a tough guy, I'm a tough guy. Even if you're a tough guy and you never show it, it really hurts. You know, sticks mm -hmm. and stones will break your bones, jumping out of the cars will break your bones, right? But mm -hmm. love, love is a message. If you want to give me some parting thoughts on that, uh, what your philosophy is. Like I always usually mention in my YouTube videos, it's all love. You know, it's like we're here to love. Everybody needs love. And like I said, from a suicidal person, that's one thing they lack is love. Or that's what they feel like they lack is love. That's all they look for. That's all they want. That's all they need is love. If they have that, they wouldn't go through a suicide attempt. And when it gets to the point where someone actually plans it, they're going to do it. So, I mean, and if they feel like they can't talk to anyone, they're just going to, they're going to do it because they don't feel loved. So it all comes from love. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm next time I meet you when this crisis is over worldwide, where I can actually mow around, uh, we'll get deeper into this. Maybe we can do something at one of the IM meetings or uh, convention or something down the road. But I really think that there's a, a lot of people that I've met that have had suicides and then had a near-death experience, some really good people. And I thought, wow, if that, if that would have been successful, we would have lost these beautiful people. Yeah. <sighs> so whatever you can do, whatever I can do, what people watching this can do to be there to listen. And I think that's a huge thing, listening. Because sometimes you can't stop somebody. Sometimes, no matter how hard you try, and I speak from experience, how hard you try, you know somebody's going to, you just know they're going to do it. Try anyway. Try to stop them anyway. They God know they're loved. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, it's, it's my honor and pleasure to call you a friend. And uh, I offer you... Uh, my partnership when you need me, when you're working with this. And I'm looking forward to your next book in a few years when you talk about the successes of the people that you've helped motivate, change, stop a suicide, save their lives. So you start off first off like you're doing. You're, you're motivating people with a story. You're trying to inspire them. Wherever you start off, that's not important. It's where you end, right? It's where you end. Right. Like on a gravestone, right? You got born with a date, right? And then there's a dash. That's your life. Then you got an end, right? But if you don't do the dash right. really good, then you don't mean much, right? So when you end this right. life, the only thing that really matters is not who loves us, because that could be influenced by all kinds of stuff. Favors, you got money, you got position, you're a celebrity. Oh, I love you. You know, <laughs> but it's who did you love? And so I know, Chris, you're out there and there's a lot of people that you love and you're empathetic with and you're giving energy to it. And so I fully support that. And I suggest people watch your videos. I hope that you do more videos. And with that, 
Uh, I want to thank you for letting me interview one of my friends. I want to thank you for having me. Like, it's super, it's a big honor to have, to actually have the time for you to take time out of your day to talk to me. Well, God bless you. We will talk privately later. God bless. And for you to watch on this, this is the first friend I'm interviewing. I may do some more. If you like this, let us know. God bless.